just one year from now, on October 14th, 2025, Microsoft will no longer support Windows 10. Despite the rapidly approaching deadline, far fewer than half of all Windows users are running Windows 11, according to various metrics. If you're in that group, do not despair. You still have some time left to figure out your options. You can go Windows 11 if you have, quote, modern hardware. And if you don't, you can go buy some new PCs which meet Windows 11 requirements. You can go the cloud route, at least for some of your employees, maybe all, with Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop, or you can get ready to pay for extended security updates and stick with Windows 10 for up to three more years. Against this backdrop, today we're going to discuss Windows' role in the enterprise and the best way for an organization to deploy Windows. Welcome to the sixth episode in a series of Directions on Microsoft podcasts that we call Brainstorm. I'm Mary Jo Foley, the Editor-in-Chief here at Directions. I'm your host for this series, where our analysts discuss emerging topics on Microsoft products, services, and most importantly, strategies. Brainstorm is your chance to see how the analysts at Directions on Microsoft do what we do. Twice weekly, we hold, quote, scope meetings, where we talk about the tech news of the week, reports we're working on, and the best ways to deliver the information that our customers need to know. Brainstorm is meant to give you a front row seat to one of these scope meetings. Today's roundtable features Michael Cherry, who covers Windows Client OS, Office Communication Services, and Corporate Governance, Jim Gaynor, who handles our coverage of Teams, Windows Server, and Enterprise Infrastructure, and Wes Miller, who oversees Azure Infrastructure, Services, Identity Management, and Systems Management, as well as co-teaching our licensing boot camps. All right, guys, here we go. Let's start talking about things at the macro level. Love it or hate it, if you're an enterprise, you're pretty much stuck with a good part of your organization running Windows. So what's the state of Windows client these days? Is Windows 11 actually stable? Should organizations decide that paying for ESUs, extended security updates for Windows 10, is a better idea than migrating to Windows 11 at this point? And should anyone still even be thinking about the mythical Windows 12? I know I'm asking you a lot of things in this opening, but let's kick it off with Michael Cherry. Thanks, Mary Jo. And let me try to answer your questions in the order you ask them. And uh, hopefully this will let the listener decide the state of the Windows client. To begin, Windows 11 is, is stable for most users. However, as is typical with Windows, they still find significant problems with each version when it comes to be the generally available because of their current method of testing. They rely mostly on Windows insiders. And that reliance does not raise to the surface pun intended, all the bugs in the OS. Mm -hmm. For example, we're hearing that Windows 11 24H2 is having problems on some hardware, including some disk storage devices, and it seems to be holding onto the temporary file space it allocates to install the update for a very long time, and it's very hard, if even possible, to delete that space. These bugs prove a lack of stability for many users and shows that organizations should not rush to install feature updates. You still need to essentially wait for service pack one. And I know that's an old reference, mm -hmm. and I know it's hard to determine what is a service pack now, but you really shouldn't be rushing to install these feature updates. So it's the second question, I firmly believe it is better to migrate or upgrade to Windows 11 rather than to rely on ESUs. ESUs only address the security updates that Microsoft, at its sole discretion, chooses to fix for Windows 10. And in the past, we have evidence that they do not choose to fix all the security vulnerabilities that they know about. Mm -hmm. This means that some of the issues that affect both Windows 10 and 11 could conceivably only be addressed on the Windows 11 builds. In this world of ransomware and other threats, using ESUs potentially increases the risk of a security incident or a breach. And this relates to the last question, should you wait for the mythical and often discussed Windows 12? No, you should not. 
There's several reasons why you should not wait, but fundamentally, if and when Windows 12 arrives, it's more likely to run on Windows 11 hardware rather than Windows 10 hardware. And it's more likely to resemble Windows 11 24H2 than any other version of Windows 10. So let me stop here and see if Wes has any comments he wants to make on these questions. Okay. Yeah, I think I think we're on the same page, Michael. The, the main thing for me is, as I think about companies stuck on Windows 10, what's the thing in front of you? You really, you, you have two choices. You either replace now or replace later because uh, those machines are not going to be upgradable to Windows 11 if they don't make the hardware works today. And and for your point, I think you're spot on. You're 12, 13, Windows 18. It doesn't matter. The point is, if Microsoft revs a version number, all that changes is they'll probably move some, move some cheese around, and the hardware requirements will get more strict, not less. There will be something new. You know, who knows, an NPU or something added that you have to have as well. So I think you're you're spot on that uh, customers should not be sitting back and waiting. Yeah, all of this is, hi, this is Jim. Um, I got, yeah, I'm just gonna pile on here. I mean, I agree with both of you, especially the topics of ESUs and waiting for Windows 12. I mean, ESUs at best, they're just kicking the can down the road. They allow you to pay for the privilege of deferring updates that, that they've been well communicated. I don't, I, nobody can really say that they're surprised at the end of support for Windows 10, um, not after having gone through Windows 7 and 8 and everything else. So you're just kicking the can down the road. You're still gonna have to deploy eventually and it's gonna be harder, you're gonna be more pressed as you do it. So if you must do ESUs, do it, but it's only a last resort and it's literally buying a little extra time. Um, and as for waiting like, oh, well maybe I will hold on just a bit longer for Windows 12. Like Wes says, yeah, maybe Windows 12 will come out, but it's just gonna be even more restrictive in hardware than Windows 11 was. And it's, as Michael's point about taking the latest and greatest version of Windows, Windows 12 is probably gonna have more problems than the most recent version of Windows 11. So the balance here is embracing what's current without immediately rushing to the latest and greatest before it's had time to shake things out. And, and you know, Mary Jo began this by stating, you know, that there's a majority of people still are running Windows, uh, Windows 10. I, I tried to find some statistics and I looked at a variety of different sources and it, it does come out to between, you know, 65 to 70 percent of users of Windows still use Windows 10. I couldn't really find any good breakdown of enterprise versus consumer. But, you know, what I'm hearing from our customers is that a large number of them are still on Windows 10. So for the sake of argument, let's imagine that most organizations still using Windows 10, they're going to pay for the ESUs. They may not like it. They may not have the exact budget for it, but they're going to probably, you know, put down the cash, buy the ESUs and, and deploy them properly. But what about consumers? This is my big worry with it. Suppose they don't buy ESUs and they don't upgrade to Windows 11. Why would they buy an ESU? This is a completely foreign concept to them. It's never <laughs> happened before, yeah. right? Right. Right? So they think they've paid for an operating system that's perpetual. They can use it until they decide they don't want to use it anymore. And they don't have to pay anything for it. So, you know, the fact that they're making ESUs available to consumers, I, I just don't think it matters. But what is this going to do if we have all these Windows 10 machines out there without ESUs on them? What does that do for the overall security of, and forgive me, I hate this term, but I think it maybe applies in this case. What does this do for the overall security of the Windows ecosystem? I think it makes it less secure. And does that raise the threat level for those of us who are using Windows 11? Does it mean there's going to be more denial of service attacks, more other attacks that are coming, more spam and other nuisance things being driven through these machines if they're turned into bots? And so maybe this is the wrong word, but I kind of think about it this way. Is it ethical for Microsoft to create this situation for users of the Windows ecosystem that it professes to care so much about? Mm. Yeah, I've seen people try to like second guess this and saying, I bet they're going to extend the end of support day for Windows 10, but I'm pretty sure they are not going to do that. I, I would bet they are not. I don't think they have the resources to do it. Yeah, no. It's not where they want to put no. people. No. no. If I were a betting woman, 
I do play poker. If I were a betting woman, <laughs> I would say, no, no way are they going to extend that. Because if they do it this time, they're going to have to do it next time and next time and next time. It's going to be become an expectation. It'll be like playing chicken. Like, should I pay for an ESU or just wait for them to actually extend the end of support? So, and yeah. there, there is a lot of whole thing like you know, the old Microsoft, you know, the old, old Microsoft. And I'm talking, you know, 10 plus years ago did, you know bend over backwards to make things backwards compatible and extend expiration dates and everything else. But that's not this Microsoft anymore. They're putting a ton of resources into specific things that aren't the scope of this particular conversation. So let's not go there. But they're putting a lot of resources there, which means they're not going to spend a bunch of extra resources making, you know, Windows 10 last longer especially right. when for all the consumers they were given free opportunity to upgrade to 11. yes they had to get new hardware but now the reason the reason for the new hardware ostensibly is hey you need a tpm so you can get secure boot so you're less la so you're so you're more secure everybody beats up on microsoft well you're not doing enough to make things secure but then when they say okay well we're going to force you to get this basic security measure in your hardware to be supported i mean okay where's the balance here right right <laughs> Okay, let's let's move on to Windows 11. Even though we have all agreed that not all of our customers are running it, but think let's talk about it anyway. Windows 11 24H2 just started rolling out, and it's got a number of additions to the product. Um, kind of some minor feature updates, some security updates, some administrative updates, um, and then it, of course has a lot of things that fall under the AI banner, like the Copilot runtime and various other AI technologies. So Wes, I know you've been looking at all the miscellaneous and sundry co-pilots for a while. Um, so with Windows 11, do you think most employees in an organization should get a co-pilot plus PC at this point? Um, or do they just need to go get a new device with, with an NPU? So Michael may or may not agree with me on this one, but I think as a whole company shouldn't put any effort into it. They shouldn't think about it. If there's an employee or a specific workload where having an NPU makes sense, having having the specific co-pilot enabled on the endpoint makes sense, mm -hmm. then then do it. Maybe there's some some specific uh, you know, RPA workloads even that companies are thinking about, well, let's put some AI in there. Mm -hmm. But I think as a whole, most employees will never use uh, AI like that on the endpoint, at least, you know, even even we're seeing Microsoft back away from what Copilot was supposed to be in Windows to be something more generic while we got AI running on the endpoint for something else now. So mm -hmm. I just, I don't think it's worth any, any defocus and more importantly, customers should be, our customers, our readers, our members, and the listeners of the podcast should be thinking about how do I get my 10 endpoints to 11? And if you stop and think about, do I need an NPU, you're wasting time because mm -hmm. your focus should be on getting a machine that can run 11, not on a machine that can run 11 and is enlightened for AI. So Wes, let me ask you about it from this perspective. And I haven't, I haven't looked at this, but I don't think you buy a Copilot Plus PC unless when you're shopping, it's the same price as a Windows 11 machine without the NPU. Uh, I mean, I, I can't see that having it does any harm, but I don't think there's any need to rush out and get one. So yes. if you just sort of watch this marketplace as AMD and Intel enter the market of providing NPUs that do the 40 plus tops um, and the price is the same, then buy them. Otherwise, uh, it's it's purely for a managed pilot program within an organization. That's it. I totally agree with that. The other thing is on top of that, I am still cynical about ARM and this is putting aside any bad news that's come about Qualcomm in the last 12 to 24 hours <laughs> uh, as far as legal challenges. Yeah. But the, the reality is that a, a you know those those Copilot Plus PCs are are innately ARC64. They're ARM64 today. They're not Intel. They're not AMD. And Intel and AMD are what most of our readers need. They need something that runs Office as it is, that Office extensions as they are, that runs drivers as they need them, and that's not an ARM PC still. So 
yes, you're absolutely right. I, that, that's why I said don't even hesitate. Just mm-hmm. go out and buy the AMD or, or uh, Intel PC that you need, and it will, as of today, won't be a uh, Copilot Plus PC. Eventually, that may change, but right. don't waste the time. Right. Yeah, supposedly before the end of this calendar year, there will be Intel and AMD-based Copilot Plus PCs, but that's, like you're saying, still like not here yet. Um, there's a lot of caveats there, so yeah. Um, let's talk about cloud PCs. So we've been talking about traditionally running a local copy of Windows on uh, your own desktop, but what about things like Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop? I'm curious if you all think these technologies are yet viable alternatives to running the latest Windows edition on dedicated hardware. Um, you know, it, since we're at an inflection point for companies who are on Windows 10 thinking about going to something else, should they be thinking about going to the cloud um, as a replacement for or in addition to what they already have? I know Jim probably has many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Me thoughts never. Um, for the first one, as a replacement, no. I mean, look, here's the thing. A lot of the features promoted by Microsoft that you know, listen to certain people and they'll tell you, oh, that's so great about you can do this with Windows 365 and this with Azure Virtual Desktop. And those features, multimedia redirection, network optimizations, having teams act like it's local, although it's actually hosted, those are great, but those require you to use Microsoft's client application for accessing those remote desktops or what Microsoft now likes to say for them to stream Windows to your desktop. You've got to use their client, which is called the Windows app, and you only get access to all of the features of the Windows app if it's running on, you guessed it, Windows. <laughs> so to make the most of Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop and all the features that they promote, you still need a Windows client device to access those remote desktops. You can't escape it entirely. So it's not a replacement. It's not, you're still going to have to have, honestly, a Windows device of some sort to access those hosted desktops or for the Microsoft to stream those desktops to you, however you want to phrase it. Now, that said, those things can let you deploy minimalist Windows client devices. They're, you know, that are very, very, you know, similar, if not identical. They're cheaply deployed, minimal amounts of memory and all of that. And you can put all your working desktops into Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop. But that's been a use case for VDI as a generic concept from the very start. You see it in call centers, retail outlets, your medical center. The question you're asking is if Windows 365 or Azure Virtual Desktop can let you escape investing in updated client devices. And honestly, it it kind of feels like the answer is no. I mean, I know there's customers out there who say, we'll just have the users connect using their personal devices. Well, that's the old shadow IT argument. Uh, some scenarios you can get away with that, but especially in any kind of regulated environment or a sufficiently large organization, or just one where you can't rely on your employees to all have a personal Windows device they're willing to work for use for work, that, that doesn't happen. So no, they're great solutions for other things. They're great things to augment it for deploying controlled desktops. Um, you know, you can, there's some scenarios in which it'll work, but you're still going to need a client device that's being managed. And I know that when we start talking about managing client devices, Wes has got stuff to say. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to comment even more than the management side. You're oh, yeah. already paying for it because mm-hmm. you, you have to have enterprise subscriptions anyway. So, you know, it's it's always a bit of a ruse to say, well, I'll just get a shared desktop instead, and then I won't have to pay. You're paying for Windows twice then. So, uh, and then you're absolutely right to enlighten the endpoint, you do need you do need that uh, the technical features of Windows anyway. And at the end of the day, you're still managing it. There's still Intune involved. There's still often Config Manager and and older tools involved. So, a lot of people looked at VDI and said, you know, it'll it'll save me all this time and money. And all it does is centralize the pain. It doesn't mm-hmm. yeah. really deliver that kind of efficiency. But it's it's helpful in certain scenarios for sure. Yeah, so, high, high, highly controlled, highly regulated environments where you really need that centralized control of the user's primary work environment. It, it's great, but if you're just, you know, your your normal organization out there without a huge a lot a huge amount of, of regulatory encumbrance, um, with a lot of knowledge workers out there, it's yeah, you're right. You're just doubling your workload in terms of what you've got to manage. I've been wondering about this and uh, being a little almost obsessed with it and. You know, managing the client is is a lot of work, right? Even if it's even if you're using this remote situation. But I, 
I went looking at some of the vendors to see what uh, dating myself yet again. It used to be called a thin PC. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the OEMs still produce these. But I noticed that uh, some of them come with a proprietary OS. And some seem to be coming with a Linux distribution. Do you guys think that is really a solution? Does that really cut down the maintenance of that uh, access device? Well, it can it could help with streamlining the, the access of the endpoint, but it gets back to Jim's point. If the Windows app only does X features like media redirection, if the client OS is Windows, then you, you're not getting all the capabilities that Microsoft is actually adding to Windows 365 and in some cases ABD. But more importantly, the, the the thing is, yes, what that does do is it removes the the burden of Windows on the endpoint. So it's it's almost a devil you know, devil you don't. don't. Because when we look at things like the uh, the outage that happened a few months ago in July, that sort of thing hit a lot of Windows endpoints that were also thin clients. So you know, if you re remove that with Linux, there's one less device that's going to go down because of that, but it's going to have different challenges instead. And, and and substantially reduced feature availability. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And again, who's, um, you know, so that introduces, you still have to maintain those endpoints. You still have yeah. to maintain those endpoints. So you've just introduced another operating system into the mix. Who's maintaining what Linux distribution they put in there? Where are you getting your patches? How are you deploying those patches? Um, you still need to update them. Yeah, right. my assumption was is that people would ignore patching them, but but you would be stuck at the functionality at the date it was delivered for the for the duration of your keeping it yeah also you have whatever you know vulnerability in samba or whatever was there the day that it shipped you, you could never yeah. frozen in carbonite <laughs> <laughs> and maybe there's nothing on that particular endpoint but if someone hacks that endpoint and they're in on that then they've got a then they've got an endpoint that's on your network and they can see other things on your network mm -hmm. you've got lateral attacks that become possible you don't want that no all right let, this is very fascinating, but let me take a quick break so that I can talk about something very different from what we're talking about. Um, we did a series of podcasts last year that were specifically about EAs or enterprise agreements. We created a six part podcast series here at Directions where we featured various members of our advisory services team led by Dean Bedwell about Microsoft EA negotiation and the process around it. So before he joined Directions, Dean spent 11 years at Microsoft where he managed the Canadian Business Desk. And there he was responsible for negotiating agreements with Microsoft's largest enterprise and public sector customers. So obviously he knows what he's talking about. Um, in our series, we discussed everything from project management to discovery, analysis, strategies for getting discounts and concessions, and negotiation levers. So whether you are brand new to the EA negotiation process or you're a veteran who wants to hear more about all the tips and tricks that we've discovered over the years, you should check out our Microsoft EA negotiation podcast series. To find it, go to directionsonmicrosoft.com slash podcast and listen to the full series for free. We've also got a free deep dive explainer on the Microsoft EA negotiation process. You can check that out on our website at directionsonmicrosoft.com. Just go to the resources tab and you can read any and all of our deep dive reports there for free. Okay, back to peering through Windows at Windows. Um, on the same day that Microsoft started rolling out Windows 11 24H2, the company also announced the Windows 11 Enterprise Long-Term Service Channel Edition, which will be supported for five years. So can an organization deploy this LTSC edition for their workforce? Uh, Michael, I know you've been putting a lot of thought into this lately. What do you think? You know, Mary Jo, in the past, I've been pretty firm with my answer to this question, and I've argued that that answer was a was a no. It was not possible to deploy the long-term servicing channel versions broadly within an organization. And that was because just after the release of Windows 10, I found documentation on Microsoft's website that the these LTSC editions would not support Office. And that is, the way it was stated at the time was, even though technically Office might install on the long-term service channel version, servicing channel version, Microsoft would not assist you with any problem or bugs that might occur. 
And the further you get from the general availability date of these products, problems will arise between the compatibility of Office apps on an LTSC version because updates to Office will likely have a dependency on a feature or a service that was cut out of the, you know, the long-term servicing channel version. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so eventually problems would drift in. But more recently, uh, I've noted that there is effectively an office enterprise long-term servicing channel. And so an organization might be able to use the office 2024 long-term servicing channel on the Windows 11 long-term servicing channel. And although the organization would be locked in on those features of the OS and the office applications as of the date that they, you know, they, they're effectively supported for, but rather than having to update you know, once every 36 months, it might allow, in particular cases, properly tested within the organization, uh, for the organization to conceivably go back to a 60-month, which is what, five? it's a five-year cycle. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is a recommendation. I'm just saying that if you line up all the channel options on paper, this looks feasible. But again, I think organizations are going to have to evaluate and test this uh, to make sure that it's viable for their client scenarios. And it may not be for all parts of the organization. It might be tactically deployed within certain parts of the organization where it makes sense. But I've only just thought about this from, you know, like I say, lining up on paper, looking at it. And I really kind of want to turn to Wes and ask this question. Even though the Windows 11, you know, long-term servicing channels get the security updates, are there security or identity issues that make this situation or this scenario impossible? No, no, I don't think there are that necessarily make it impossible. The thing is, customers have to understand really two things going into this. The first of which is, by choosing the LTSC route, you're choosing all LTSC, which means LTSC client, like you've highlighted, which unusually now supports, quote, Office. Uh, but then the Office LTSC, which we we sometimes dance around, but it's important for customers to remember, that's not the same thing that you get when you subscribe to Office 365. So you don't have any rights to that in almost any cases. If you buy Office 365 as a subscription, you have to buy it as a distinctly separate thing. So to me, there's two pieces that are uh, of distinct value if you say, well, d where does this make sense or, or does it make sense? First of all, completely disconnected scenarios. If you think about uh, a lot of parts of our government in particular, but governments around the world, uh, and then beyond military, uh, industrial stuff that you don't want connected to the internet, LTSC of both Windows and Office makes a ton of sense because you don't want this activating through AAD, through intra ID. You don't want it tethered and phoning home every 30 to 60 days. Uh, so that's the first thing. It gives you a great scenario for the, the offline. But that's also, to your point, Michael, that gives you uh, limitations in terms of connecting to Office 365 services. But remember, you didn't get those when you bought Office anyway. So if it's disconnected, treat it like it's disconnected. But the other interesting side to me is that it does give you a longer runway, but it's important for customers to remember two things there also. First, uh, 60 months. Okay, that's better than 36. 60 is more than 36. But also remember, Microsoft is not going to come back to you and say, well, you know, we're we know you're really comfortable with that Windows 11 LTSC, so we're going to give you ESUs. Never expect ESUs for an LTSC. Mm -hmm. You're going to get another LTSC, and you're going to have to upgrade to that. So all you're doing is moving the goalposts another 24 months firmly and saying you're going to have to upgrade. And it's really important for customers to remember that because this is not a 10 year runway anymore. This is a five year runway in all but embedded scenarios. So I think it's interesting and customers specifically those who need to run offline should look at the all LTSC route, but beyond that, look away. <laughs> yeah. You know, Wes, I, I joke a little bit. It, it's not just high security situations where you want to have a, an air gap. Uh, you know, we've had certain employees throughout the history of even directions where uh, they had this tendency to click on things they should never have clicked on. And I, I always thought maybe we should have air gapped some of our own personnel. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're at every company, Michael. Yeah. You're absolutely right. They're not talking about me, by the way. I don't know who they're talking about, but no. not me. <laughs> there's, there's one more thing I want to throw in here, too. And we start talking about having the long periods of support is that 
you're talking about the software. Well, there's the hardware too. Um, let's say that 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 machine you, that you have, they say, oh, I'm going to put LTSC on that on that. Now I can, I can use that machine for five more years. Well, you know, things break, especially when you're deploying large versions of them. There's always a certain amount of breakage. Something fails, and you're going to have to replace that. And one thing that does tend to happen um, with Windows hardware, with my, with any vendor, Apple does it too, is well, you replace it, and guess what? That 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 revision of hardware that you had before, they don't sell that anymore, and they sell this new one, and this new one requires a certain update and a certain patch, and maybe that's not available for your LTSC version. So the thing is be aware of the underlying hardware and the lifespan of that hardware when you decide to make a deployment relying on long-term support of the software that you run on it. Good point. Okay, uh, let's switch gears, talk about deployment now. Um, of course, there's always the option to have your OS locally installed on a desktop or a laptop and use tools like Intune, Config Manager, Autopilot, Autopatch to manage the operating system. But that's been the main way to deploy Windows for a long time. And it goes against Microsoft's current cloud-first strategy. What about VDI? Who wants to start there? I'll start. Fine. All uh, right. Go know, ahead. <laughs> so I have a I have an interesting stance on imaging versus upgrade, as Michael can attest to, uh, given working in setup years ago. And I think one of the things that's interesting to think about is the fact that VDI as a whole is a different way of deploying the OS. For example, you don't usually start with a a DVD image like you did when when I started working with Windows or a CD image back in the day. That's an important thing to understand because the goal with VDI is, is we've talked about to try and get efficiencies. So you're trying to deploy these standard images, you're trying to uh, attach applications, which Jim has written a ton about the technologies Microsoft has either uh, built in certain cases, but often acquired to try and make attaching applications to Windows easier which by the way is funny because they've reinvented a few things we suggested to the office team 20 years ago, but I digress. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the, you know, the, they're trying to take sort of some of the ideas of imaging and attach them to VDI uh, in a way that makes more sense for VDI since VDI isn't about spinning disks per se. It's about virtual machines. Uh, so at least it's abstracted virtual disks. So there's still sort of a, a meet in the middle uh, but I think at the end of the day, you're still using the same technologies to manage it. And Microsoft is slowly but surely expanding things like Intune to cover things uh, like you know the multiple instance variants or additions of of Windows, for example. So we're we're there's still a space for imaging, uh, but it's different in the VDI world than it was classically in the world of Windows that Michael and I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So well, if there. More I was oh. going to ask a follow up here. If if there's session based and vir virtual machine based solutions, is there like a real advantage or disadvantage of one over the other? Economics. This, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but this is also an interesting it, it, it's it's kind of a shame that this term VDI came into into the lexicon because, you know, virtual desktop infrastructure it seems to imply in a lot of people's minds that it's virtual machine uh, desktop infrastructure. And there's this old thing kicking around since the days of uh, of uh, Windows Server, you know, first Windows Server instances called Sessions. And I think Sessions are, are really often overlooked today, and they may still be a very uh, viable solution for organizations that want to go a virtualized Windows route. Session-based virtual desktops run in one session on the Windows OS. Generally, that's Windows Server OS, but each user's virtualized Windows environment is isolated from the other. Uh, no one can see from one session into another session. They can't see the other user's data or work. Heavy users doing a lot of computational work could impact the performance of the other sessions, although that's you know, these days with all the memory and stuff that we have and everything else, that's still somewhat theoretical. I've never really seen it occur when most users are running, you know, office productivity software. We're not talking about heavy graphics kind of software. Mm -hmm. 
On the other hand, virtual machine-based virtual desktops each have their own virtual machine. So again, there's the isolation for the users. But each VM consumes considerable resources, maybe more resources than needs to be allocated to that person's work. Key here, and I'm coming around to changing my mind on this, you have to be really careful to treat this as alternatives, but not an either or. It's not that you should go and say, we're going to use all sessions, or we're going to go and use all virtual machines, or we're going to go and use all Windows uh, 365, or we're going to go use all Azure Virtual Desktop. It's really about picking the right method to virtualize desktops for each uh, each particular area. And kind of before I give up the floor, the one last thing I want to ask about, because I, I really want to hear Wes and Jim's thoughts on this, I don't believe either of these solutions, virtual machine-based or session-based virtual desktops, provides what would be the equivalent of what I'll call a Copilot Plus PC image. That is, I'm not sure that there is any way to access uh, local AI-based services that would rely on a local or virtualized NPU within the virtual machine or within the session. Um, I guess maybe the way I want to say it is right now, I don't think that in the hypervisors, there's the concept of a virtualized NPU. So I, I look forward to hearing what the other guys have to say about that part of the equation as well. I want to jump in. Um, I, I Before I came into the Windows world, I was a Unix guy. And Unix, by its nature, has multiple concurrent sessions in a machine. So I just want to, I mean, back in the mid-90s, I was just like, why doesn't Windows NT allow people to meaningfully log in multiple times? What's Why are they so behind? So it's always <laughs> been fun to me to, to look at this and, and to see, oh, now you guys are getting sessions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I had multiple people log in, just I had an external, but that's a whole other technology thing there. Um, one thing I want to say really quick about multi-session, though, is that this is also a way that Microsoft is keeping some of the cookies for themselves, is yes, you can have multi-session, which means multiple people using the same either piece of hardware or VM simultaneously, so you get better resource utilization. But traditionally, that's been just Windows Server. Only Windows Server supported multiple simultaneous user sessions. They now have these multi-session version editions of Windows 10 and Windows 11 client, but the only place you can get those is Azure Virtual Desktop, either in Azure, you can if you use Azure Virtual Desktop or Stack HCI, but none of the others, you can't license it for use in RDS, you can't license it for use in Citrix, unless it's a Citrix on top of AVD, you can't license it for use in, in VMware. This is a cookie that Microsoft is keeping for themselves. And if you're doing things for end users, you really want to have the Windows 10 or 11 client because you know there's all these little minor UI differences and some users, that's enough to set them off. Um, so just in that discussion of sessions and not sessions, I just wanted to bring that up. Like, yes, it's there, it's a great solution, but it's only a Microsoft thing and they're, they're keeping that to themselves. Wes, before I mention anything else, you want to pop in? No, I was just going to echo the exact same thing about Windows multi-session. And it brings up all the same caveats that, that Michael mentioned. You know, you have to think about this from a, an interactive perspective. You know, is, is the user uh, performing a task? Is user X performing a task that could in, impinge on user Y? And in general, especially if you've dedicated enough memory and the right VM host to it, this won't be something you'd see impacted. Because this is still... It's terminal services. It's just running on a client. It's literally the exact same infrastructure. They just made it work the same way it used to work in Media Center Edition. But again, I digress. So the multi-session is there, and I think that works for many, many cases. And more importantly, we've already had customers who said, listen, we ran the numbers and we tried to go with Amazon Workspaces, which has different ways to run it. But again, you can't get multi-session. And then you compare that to what you can do in, in Azure with Windows multi-session. And that's what I meant by jokingly saying economics, that you literally cannot match that. Uh, mm -hmm. So if session-based desktops make sense for the application roles you're deploying to your users, that's something unique to Azure that you can't do anywhere else. And it's, it's unique based on licensing, totally. Mm -hmm. It's not a technology Absolutely. thing. It's a licensing thing. They, they won't let you use it anywhere else. Yeah. Um, 
to go back to just kind of like you know deploying them and managing them managing them i do want to mention like a lot of the traditional you know like West talked a lot of the traditional deployment of virtual desktop using VM images. You've got VM images preloaded with specific applications and settings and user, you know, uh, we had a, different, a lot of different things where user data would be somehow attached during the login process in a separate way. Um, AVD also has, uh, when you license AVD, you get all your, everything's all licensed up. You get FS logics bundled into it, which is one of the solutions that Wes mentioned being acquired. And that cannot just attach user data in a container and not talking about Kubernetes containers, but kind of a, a file system container that gets grafted onto that VM that accesses the user data and all of the user preferences. But they can also, there's technologies to now allow you to graft in applications. And so that lets you have a generic VM, someone connects to the generic VM and then their applications and their data follow them. Um, it requires a fair amount of planning, configuration, testing, and constant work of things, but you, you can still work with that. And yet there's still that balance. AVD now does support using Intune for OS management. Even when you're using the session-based desktops, you can use Intune. You can use MDM. Does it do everything that you're used to if you are if you were deploying images or using Config Manager? Not quite there, but you mentioned early on, Mary Jo, that Microsoft's trying to have their cloud-first version of things, which includes the cloud management tools. And they're definitely moving more towards using those tools. If you're using Windows 365, the Intune console is how you look at your cloud PCs. So okay. that shift is definitely happening. Nice. All right. I am going to take another quick break before we go to our customer question and the hot button segment. So in this uh, part, I would like to talk about our world famous Microsoft licensing boot camps. Um, if you have not yet had the opportunity to participate in one of these multi-day learning events, you are missing out. I got to go to Atlanta last year for the boot camp, and I really felt like the quantity and the quality of information was very impressive. You have the opportunity to talk with the directions analysts who are there, as well as other customers, and that's what makes the event. It is the place to update and ensure your knowledge is current. So we've got another in-person licensing boot camp coming up in January, January 13th to 15th in Orlando. Florida, for people who don't know. Uh, and then there will be another virtual one this year from December 9th through 13th, if you'd rather attend virtually. In addition, in addition to boot camps, we also offer other advisory services, such as the aforementioned EA negotiation support and Microsoft strategy assessments, where we can help you one-on-one -on -one with your specific Microsoft product questions and licensing issues. To learn more, go to directionsonmicrosoft.com or you can email info at directionsonmicrosoft.com and that way you can learn about all the services that we offer. All right, now time for our customer questions segment where we actually tell you about a customer question we received. So we're gonna keep names out of it and locations out of it so you don't know who the customer is, but uh, we did have an enterprise customer recently contact directions with a question that is on theme with today's discussion. The customer asked us, is remote desktop services still available and still viable? I am sure Jim has some things he would like to say there. So that we actually had not one, but two customers ask the ah, exact same question. Interesting. Um, okay. And I'm going to say up front that I think some of the confusion about this is there's remote desktop services um, and, you know, remote desktop services is still alive and kicking. Okay? okay. It hasn't been deprecated. It's still included as a set of roles in Windows Server 2025, which is, you know, expected to go GA probably around Ignite. It's in preview. It's not on the deprecation list. Um, it's been there for a long time, but it hasn't had any meaningful updates since Windows Server 2016. There was going to be a full revamp. They were planning. They talked about it when I first started with Directions in 2017. They were talking about remote desktop modern infrastructure, having the roles built as services that you could run as app services in Azure. It was looking really interesting. And then they went silent about it for a while. And then we heard about what was called Windows Virtual Desktop, eventually relabeled as Azure Virtual Desktop. Well, the story that I was eventually told by a, an unnamed Microsoft person at uh, an Ignite in Orla at an Ignite in Orlando was that 
they showed this. They showed all the remote desktop modern infrastructure again, which services that can be in Azure. And they demoed it to Satya, and he said, "Why aren't we packaging this as an Azure first hosted service? Hmm. Why are we, you know, why why isn't why aren't we making this a service in Azure?" And that's how AVD was born. Hmm. So. Remote desktop services is still kicking, but you're not going to see updates because the update is AVD. That is the update. That's what they turned it into. Um, so it's been getting all the development capabilities. It's been getting all the development efforts, the new features, which are shared with Windows 365, which is built on AVD. Um, but none of that is coming back to RDS. Not even, um, you know, not even the licensing stuff we talked about, about multi-session versions of Windows client. You can't get them. And really, every time a new version of Windows Server comes out, I look, I'm like, I'm waiting to hear like, oh, we're deprecating RDS. And they haven't done it yet because mm -hmm. there's still too many customers that are running it and it's huge. So, you know, for right now, you know, um, it wasn't done with Windows Server 2023. You know, it's not on the list. We're going to means we've reset the deprecation clock for three more years until they announce a deprecation. And even if they announce a deprecation, you've got your, you know, five, you know, five, 10 years of support left, but it's stagnant. It's yeah. not getting anything. It's days or number. And I wouldn't recommend anybody invest additional effort into it. So it's kicking, but not necessarily alive is what you're saying. <laughs> is it is it kicking or is it twitching? Yeah. I, well, and I think. I think to nail that point down, you're absolutely your seat. You see it there. I see it with with uh, Active Directory that you know that the, there's nuanced changes, but most of those changes are enhancements to bring it you know to work better with the cloud. But the, the important piece I look at with RDS again, me with my my licensing spectacles that turn the world a horrible shade of red. Uh, the the when you look at RDS, the most interesting thing to me is if you want to run office on it, what do you have to do? And it's back to that same LTSC argument because you basically get office on RDS for five years and it's not the subscription version that your users are used to. So there's so many caveats to it that you shouldn't be running office on RDS. Now you should treat it as deprecated, even though it's still in the box. Yeah, because if you're using Office on RDS and you're trying to get sessions, then you're using sessions on Windows Server, and the whole Windows Windows Server only supports Microsoft 365, the subscription version, um, during its mainstream support period. So Windows Server, you know, Windows Server 20, Windows Server 2022, it's already coming up on three years into its mainstream support. That means there's two more years of mainstream support for that. That means you've got two more years to be able to run Windows, Microsoft 365 on Windows Server 2022 terminal server hosts before it's not supported. Hmm. All right. Good answer for our two customers and others, who I'm sure, who have that same question. If, uh, one thing I learned from if one person asks it, 10 people are wondering it. Yep, for sure. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move to hot buttons. This is a segment in our meetings where people can talk about what they're working on, things they're looking at in the world of Microsoft, things that are catching their eye or they want to dig deeper into. Um, so what are your hot buttons this week, everyone? I'll, I'll go first. Uh, okay. My hot button is uh, falls out of the uh, CrowdStrike Windows incident this summer. And it would seem uh, in the aftermath of this, <clears throat> excuse me, in the aftermath of this, it seems Microsoft has a defensible position for uh, stopping um, kernel drivers from third parties. Um, and we saw what happened. Um, sure, steps could be taken to make to tighten those drivers and make them better and inspect them and test them, but that's just not going to happen. This is important for organizations who may be using third-party anti-malware software. And uh, if you're coming up on a renewal with these service providers, you want to be thinking this through uh, because the way that their products work today may not be the way that they work in the near future. This was talked about a lot right after the incident, then it kind of went silent, but I think it's something that people need to be keeping in mind. And it's it's beyond security software. There's still some weird hardware pieces and, and old practitioners of this 
uh, bad practice of writing kernel drivers. Um, and, and I think we'll see Windows go the route that Apple has done, and it just it's just not going to be be a, an available option going forward. That's it. Okay. Jim, Wes? Okay, I'll go. Right. Um, one, I, I wrote a report. You'll, you, if you're on the website, you'll see it already. Um, if not, it's going to be in print pretty soon. I wrote a report on, on places, which is Microsoft managed workspace thing. But it's not about places. It's about some of the weird things that are happening with licensing. And, and you know, this I, I, I means I'm picking up the knife from the stuff that Wes and uh, Rob Horowitz <laughs> normally work in. But it's this habit of when Microsoft has licensed their services, it's traditionally been, hey, here's a discrete thing that you can buy or your battery's not included, or here's the suite and it's all in the suite. And what they're doing with places and they're starting to do with other things is kind of this weird middle ground. Um, if you want to get the enhanced features of places, you buy Teams Premium. All right. Um, it's not you know, you, you, you get that like, so teams, so teams, the core features are included in the suite, but if you want the enhanced features, it's not a places enhanced SKU that you buy, you buy teams premium, which has other things. And by the way, there's a other app coming. There's a, the, the Qs app, which works with teams phone for helping you manage call center people that are using auto attendance and stuff. And that's bundled into teams premium. Oh, um, okay. You have some stuff happening with um, Project that's now you've got Planner, uh, which has incorporated all the stuff that used to be Project for the web, but you've got Planner included with the Office suites that's you know has these basic capabilities of Project for the web stuff. But if you want more of the more of the capabilities that used to be Project for the web, then you need to buy a Planner, a Project Plan Three or Plan Five license, which yes has traditional Project, but then it also adds these Project for the web things. So it's it's these mini bundles that they're starting to do um, teams premium being the high example, but others, and it's this weird middle ground that they're, that they're doing. And I, I, I mean, part of me, I part of me gets it. Part of me doesn't. And I know that customers that want discrete things are getting frustrated by it. Just trying to wrap myself around it, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess sort of in that same vein, I would say that, you know, you and you and I've talked at length, Mary Jo, about will they, won't they E7. And it goes back to what Jim's point was. But I think the, the more important thing for me is I'm actually... If anything, I'm approaching everything right now from what I believe to be the perspective of our customers who are also Microsoft's mutual customers, uh, because the reality is uh, all of our customers are struggling for budget. All of our customers are struggling for time. All of our customers are struggling to try and figure out what it is that Microsoft is trying to sell them versus what they actually need. Mm -hmm. And so I'm instead of focusing in on a lot of Microsoft's messaging, I don't actively plan to listen to Ignite because it's a lot about stuff that Microsoft wants to sell you right. and not about the stuff that a lot of our customers are actually ready to take or even want to take anytime in the near future. So for me, it's actually looking the other way and figuring out what the what the things are for our customers that I actually have to help them understand so that they can make the right decisions given the lack of time budget lack of financial budget and lack of resources in terms of people that they all are facing today. So, you know, Microsoft is trying to sell everyone AI and everyone, you know, E7-ish features and nobody's got budget. Nobody's got right. time to understand it. Nobody's got time to take these things in, in a, in a responsible way without blowing the, the side of their budget, you know, away. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. The hard part about a podcast is you can't hear me emphatically nodding over here. <laughs> I heard it, Jim. I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> well, while these guys are ignoring Ignite, I will be paying attention to Ignite. I think I'm going to get to go to Ignite in person. So if anyone listening to the podcast wants to meet up, if you're a member or a prospective member of Directions, I will be around, hanging out, sneaking around, doing my usual at, in Chicago live. Uh, so please feel free to reach out. Alrighty, I think that's a wrap. Um, it's a so long I just wrap. Wanna, Thanks, everybody. A long wrap. I want to remind our listeners they can find lots more coverage of all things Microsoft related on directionsonmicrosoft.com. Thank you very much for listening. If you have questions, 
comments, or any topics you would like to hear the Directions Analysts cover in one of these kinds of podcasts, please do not hesitate to contact me via X at Mary Jo Foley. And speaking of X or Twitter, we at Directions have converged our Twitter channels into an, a single platform. So give us a follow at Directions MSFT for all the latest Microsoft Enterprise product and licensing information. Thanks again.